As the pandemic rages on, what's the impact on businesses and what's the outlook? This is the Issues Watch podcast. Hi, I'm Jeff Kazerman, Vice President of Government Relations at the New Jersey Society of CPAs, and welcome to episode 59. To say that 2020 has been a challenging year for New Jersey businesses would be a massive understatement. An already challenging business environment became exponentially more challenging when the coronavirus pandemic caused widespread shutdowns earlier this year. From restrictions and closings to supply chain issues to workplace safety and staffing, the issues that business owners have had to grapple with are numerous. Today, I'm joined by someone who's intimately familiar with all of these issues, Michelle Sekirka, President and CEO of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, also known as NJBIA, as the nation's largest statewide employer association, NJBIA represents every industry in the state. And their members, including us, the NJCBA, employ more than 1 million people. So Michelle definitely has her finger on the pulse of the issues impacting New Jersey businesses and what they see on the horizon for 2021. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for the opportunity, Jeff. So your organization just released the results of its annual business outlook survey, which includes responses from more than a thousand New Jersey business owners on, uh, it looks at a number of topics. So in light of the pounding that the economy has taken from the coronavirus pandemic, it comes as no surprise, uh, I think to anybody, that the survey makes for very sober reading. So can we, let, let's discuss some of the, the key items in the survey. When it comes to revenue, how did the respondents, how have the respondents been affected by the pandemic? And what do they anticipate for 2021? Yeah, sadly, three out of four, three out of four have suffered losses. And they say that it will take them a year, if not more, or perhaps they might not even get back to equilibrium. Equilibrium being making perhaps $1 of profit just enough to cover their expenses. Well, that's not good. No. <laughs> uh, that's not surprising though. No. Uh, and how about hiring and salaries? Yeah, well, we see the unemployment rates. I mean, we know that um, hiring was pretty flat uh, this year. Uh, we know that looking forward to 2021, um, in terms of salaries, about 40% of those surveyed uh, said that there will not be salary increase. Um, about 24 to 5% said there will be increase, but one to about 2.9%. So it's gonna be pretty flat. Right. Um, and when, again, we're not surprised because uh, we're just not generating the revenue needed to cover our expenses. And so without that proper revenue, uh, we, 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 can't, we can't increase. Okay, um, again, no surprise. What did the respondents cite as their their biggest concerns? And uh, how did that compare to previous surveys and and the concerns that they they cited then? Yeah, so interesting, you know, we we always start from the premise that in a pre-COVID world, uh, New Jersey was a state that was really challenged in terms of affordability and regional competitiveness. And so we have consistently seen um, through the last five years, at least of this survey, if not 60 years of this survey, right. uh, property tax, healthcare costs, and cost of doing business is the top three issues. Um, and true to form, that, that still came through. But what I would say is that, you know, in a COVID world, world these issues are exacerbated. So when you already start behind the eight ball, you know, when you're already an outlier, uh, and in some cases, extreme outlier, it's like, how, how, how much more far down can you go? Yeah and, yeah. and we're about there, Jeff. We are about there in terms of the sentiment. Yeah. And uh, pretty obvious to me. And one, uh, another area, not so much during COVID, although it happened then too, that, that has really deteriorated in, in my opinion, uh, is the liability environment. 
like the gender equity bill, uh, which nobody's against gender equity, but all those little things for the trial lawyers that were tucked in there. Uh, I mean, they're just liability uh, exposure nightmares. And there's just been so much of that passed sure. in the last few years. Well, um, think about think about um, the workers, the workers comp, you know, the right. presumption, the the shift of the presumption historically workers comp, the um, the burden of evidence is on the claimant. So right. the employee in a normal world has to prove that they were injured in the workplace. They're the one who has to bring that evidence forward, okay? What our legislature did this year in the middle of COVID was shifted that presumption uh, relative to getting COVID to say, if someone presents with COVID as an employee, there's a presumption that they got it at the workplace. And think about that for a minute. They put that into law at an exact time where we had employees going on vacation to hot right. sex and coming back like, Really? And so, you know, talking to our insurance agencies, um, they are so concerned about, you know, how this is going to increase the cost of workers' comp insurance. And then, of course, that's going to have an impact on premium. And, and, you know, so this just the fact that we keep piling on while we're in the middle of a pandemic where I just said three out of four businesses suffered revenue, revenue loss that they will not see if they're even still in business for at least a year or more is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I guess I would say for the last three or four years, the, the, there's been a lot of piling on, and then there's been even more now, when we can, uh, you know, le when businesses can can least tolerate it. So, yeah, it just gets every year. It gets more uh, incredible to me how hostile, I would say out outright hostile to the business community. Um, but were there any surprises uh, that you found in the survey results? Anything you weren't expecting to see? Sadly, um, you know, no surprises given given the circumstances. I would say um, just super sobering, though. I mean, the comments. So we each year we we get people who give narrative comments. Right. The two sets of comments were off the charts. Number one, the pain. And the 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 you could feel you could feel the the economic and personal hurt come through. And I keep trying to tell the story that economic pain is personal pain. These are livelihoods we're talking yes. about. Mm -hmm. If you can't generate income to come home and feed and clothe and shelter your family, that is personal pain. That comes through in this survey. The other is the wow <laughs> amount of colorful colorful words that our business leaders and our business owners have for our policymakers. Mm -hmm. They are beyond um, not just frustrated, but they're kind of like disgusted at this point. And, and they've just really, you know, I haven't seen this type of language in a survey um, ever. You know, our organization is one of the many organizations, I think there's maybe a hundred, that are part of the New Jersey Business Coalition, which uh, was an initiative uh, that you guys, the NJBIA, organized, put together in the early days of the pandemic. Can you tell us a little about the coalition and what it's trying to accomplish? Absolutely. So correct, at the very beginning of the emergency, um, we thought it was significantly important to pull together uh, the, the business voice. And so we reached out to our colleagues. We are over a hundred strong business and nonprofit. And so I want to emphasize whenever I talk about business or employers, I'm including the nonprofit associations with that. But these are associations representing business and nonprofit. Um, we meet twice a week. Now, here we are nine months going into 10 months, right? Nine months in pandemic. We have calls twice a week. We still get almost 60 people on every single call, which is incredible, which means, you know, the momentum is still there and the issues are still impactful. So early on, this was all about how do we support each other and the business community uh, to understanding the EOs, what it means to everybody? Um, you know, how do we get answers quickly through the network? How do we get grassroots going to all of our all of our members and businesses so that they can understand? Can you be open? Are you essential, non-essential? And that we can advocate together. And so early on, we put together a policy document that had probably 25 policy points, half of which were state and half of which were federal. 
Uh, we worked with our, our state um, you know, delegates, but our federal, federal delegates as well on CARES Act funding and things like that. Uh, so very impactful. And then at the state level, advancing what we thought New Jersey business needed early on. Um, and then at the same time, advocating for some of the challenging issues uh, as we moved along, like getting businesses open. And if you go back to June and July, um, oh my gosh, like as we were slowly, ever so slowly, despite crushing the curve, opening our businesses, right? We were stuck in that big pause mode for indoor activities and restaurants. And, you know, the coalition was impactful at sending message um, and, and, and hosting town halls and telling the yep. small business story about how these businesses were out there checking all the safety boxes. And if they could do that, you need to, you need to let them open, right? The last big thing I would say about the coalition is we put together the um, recovery and reinvention framework, which was the guidelines and best practices and pathway to reopening. And then we advocated that to the governor. And one important point here is we advocated early on for a regional approach to reopening the economy. Um, and, and, and the governor early on and his people said, well, we can't do that. New Jersey's too small. Someone will drive from here to here and it won't make a difference. Lo and behold, now we're in a regional pattern, right? And, 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 and the governor is deferring to locals and counties. And we're like, okay, so we got there. But the fact that we had to fight so hard on the reopening to get there um, was extraordinary. And I, and I think unfair. Right. I, I remember uh, way back when looking at that, uh, document, which uh, was like you said, I think it covered or it did cover a lot of different industries, and it was a great bl blueprint for what to do going forward. And it doesn't look like uh, the administration and the lawmakers have really uh, done too much that was in that document, which is uh, a real shame because uh, it was it was really a phenomenal. Uh, comprehensive document, uh, I remember saying, wow, there's a, there's a lot of good information and data and, and ideas in here. Um, and that's what's I, lacking, Jeff, you know, yeah. that, that comprehensive plan. That's why we did that. Um, you know, there is no comprehensive plan for what the next six to eight months of COVID looks like relative to the business community. We wake up as a state every day and we're in block and tackle. We're in a, we're in a tactical yeah. mode. And that right. is that is um, not appropriate right now. You know, we right. need a strategic, uh, comprehensive plan with scenarios. You know, if the scenario plays, because you know, you know as as well as we do, business needs predictability and certainty. Business does not wake up every day and react and respond. They have a plan, and they have right. to plan financially and strategically on business models, and they think about contingencies. And we need the state to step up and do that. Other than uh, this lack of planning and foresight, what do you see or your members see as the greatest governmental obstacles that businesses and nonprofits are, are facing as they try to remain open and do business during this, pan this pandemic? Yeah, you know, uh, lack of balance in policy. So we've got a host of mandates. Every day there's a new, new mandate. You know, mandate on business, mandate on business, mandate on business, okay? And uh, an example is while New Jersey businesses far and wide were, safety, were checking the safety boxes, right? Safeguards to bring their employees back or retail to have customers come in and everything. They're not getting any credit for that, meaning you check all those safety boxes, we should be giving you protection on liability in exchange because we told you this is exactly what you need to do in order to be allowed to operate, right? Uh, no, instead, we just pile on those mandates uh, with expense. And it, that's not fair. There needs to be balance. If you're going to have a mandate put on business, then you need to give the business the protection that they deserve when they do exactly what you told them to do. The other thing that is frustrating, and I find as um, absolutely a, uh, an obstacle, is that our policymakers, they make policy in a vacuum. And right now, relative to COVID, there's only one policymaker making decisions. That's the governor. Yeah. I mean, we're an autocratic rule because we're in an, under an emergency order, right? So there's one person making every decision. Those decisions are made without clear understanding of what the boots on the ground impact and consequences of policy is. So you, you know, you here's a great example of just this week, right? You talk about new uh, indoor restrictions, and you talk about the idea of restricting um, indoor sports and what that means. Do you know that set off an entire cascade? of indoor businesses like 
the dance studios, the karate schools, the gymnastics schools, all these youth recreational educational programs that are thousands upon thousands of Main Street businesses across the state of New Jersey who are standing there scratching their head going, did he just shut us down? Well, no, he didn't shut them down. He shut down their competition teams, okay? But he didn't shut them down. But they don't, but in order to clearly understand that we had to go and ask for clarification three and four times over, right? These are people's livelihoods we're messing with. And without understanding the true consequence of what is the term use of, you know, indoor sports mean, and being clear on what you mean, um, you set off a cascade of concern. Yeah, uh, we went through the same thing when, um, way back in the beginning when they said only essential businesses can stay open. And at least in the original executive order, it was not clear at all what yeah. essential was. And we had members, oh, so many members saying, you know, well, it doesn't say in here that we're essential and we have to close and is that true? And the way it was written, if I recall correctly, is executive order listed all those businesses that were definitely non-essential and everything else was, the, the implication was that they could stay open. Yeah, we talk about all the confusion and, you know, early on was this confusion for um, remote work and the use of the term, you know, should work remotely uh, if, if you can. And, you know, if you, if you look up the definition of should, it actually is a mandate as shall. But a lot of people think it's uh, well, if you can. Um, and to this day now, you have people saying, well, we have um, we're following capacity restrictions so we can bring people back and we're doing it safely. You have others who are saying I can't bring people back because I they should still work remote. Right. There's been confusion nine months, 10 months of confusion now. In the eyes of the coalition, what is uh, the governor and the administration doing right? And what are they doing wrong uh, in the handling of this pandemic and in particular its impact on businesses? Uh, is there anything that you would give them credit for? Absolutely. Early on, we'll give, we'll give the governor credit for crushing the curve. And that was the goal. Um, where we went sideways is we crushed the curve and we did nothing then to bring the economic balance that was needed in a timely manner. And so the way I do this, I, I'm, I'm an attorney, so I, everything is in scales of justice, right? <laughs> so the idea was uh, crushing the curve meant you, the, the healthcare numbers get better, meaning that you know deaths go down, hospitalizations go down. The balance on that was then the economy should be opening up. So what we had happening is you know, numbers are going down, numbers are going, keep going down, crush the curve, crush the curve. Economy slowly start opening, but then it was like we got stuck like right here. We're like, yeah. why are we stuck in this pause? You know, all through through June, all through June to the beginning of July, and then the whole fiasco with restaurants. Yeah, oh, restaurants oh, yeah. can open. You know, July July first, right before Fourth of July weekend, and then you know Sunday night into Monday morning after they went and bought all their products for a holiday, the next day said changed our mind. But in the meantime, yeah. the curve was crushed. So again, I just want to say it's this consistent lack of balance that is frustrating that we think and we ask and we do. We talk to the governor's folks. Look, the governor's folks engage us all the time. I give credit. They take our calls. They want to hear from us. They, 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 they engage us, but they don't really listen to what we're saying. And we yeah. only we bring data with what we say. You know, we don't pontificate. We don't shoot from the hip. We don't make stuff up. All right. We think we're very responsible in our response. And we talk to our healthcare workers. We, we have a monthly call with our executives from our hospital systems and say, is our advocacy being, um, are we safe? Like, are we okay the way we're advocating? They say, yes, you are, we can handle this. So that's just where we think that at this point, you know, we need the governor to come back around with more balance. How do you and the business coalition, or what are your concern, concerns about the process that that they are using. Is there anything you would add to that or is there even a process? <laughs> well, maybe? that's the issue. I mean, it's the issue. Again, I, th I truly, I, I feel as though we are living in a uh, tactical, you know, block and tackle mode. We wake up every day and it's like, hmm, let's see what the numbers say. Okay, what are we gonna do in response to what the numbers say today? And then, oh, tomorrow we'll decide what we'll do when we see what the numbers are tomorrow. And that's not a plan. Yeah, right. that's just not a plan. And I think business owners are um, where they were extremely frustrated early on is they got to the starting block really quick on what it was going to take to safeguard their workplace. And as soon as they could check the safety boxes, they should have been able to open. My gosh, we were just like super outlier. 
Yeah, yeah. super outlier. All the rest of the country was, you know, responsibly opening. And yes, some had, you know, quick surges because they didn't open responsibly or never closed, right? In New Jersey, we followed all the rules. And guess what? We proved, we proved that we could keep those, those numbers down. So we were too late to let businesses reopen. As a result of that, we lost a lot of businesses that we may not ever get back. Um, I will give a little credit with the scalpel approach right now. However, um, in the scalpel approach is still a lot of this confusion. Uh, every day we get some new rule that we go, well, what does that really mean? So I'm a little nervous about the next month, but I'm going to hold the governor true to his word that he's going to continue to have a scalpel approach uh, and not a full on closure. So um, if you were the governor, if you got elected tomorrow, <laughs> uh, and I don't know you. No, but thank you. you. <laughs> That's how I feel. Is there anything that you would do differently um, than than uh, governor and the administration are doing are do, that they are doing right now. Anything you uh, would do differently that you haven't already uh, touched upon? Are, are there any things you can think of? Yeah, I mean, I would say the things I mentioned are exactly the things we advocated for. I would execute on the recovery and reinvention framework document that we put out because I believe that that there was an extremely responsible pathway to um, opening the state and securing our economy. Uh, that along with a long-term comprehensive approach, you know, if it was just right today, and uh, we're looking at this like second wave and what the next six to eight months are, I'd, I'd immediately be saying, you know, here are three or four different scenarios with transparency. You know, I'd say, hey, everybody, if the numbers go here, we gotta do this. If the numbers go here, we gotta do that. The way to keep the numbers down is this, right? So a little bit more uh, transparency on the triggers to activity. You know, the, yeah. the governor tells us what the metrics are. We hear them in the press conference all the time. Hospitalizations, ventilation, death. Like we get that, right? Positivity rate. But what, what the, the magic numbers and understanding what's going what's gonna to trigger the next mm, type of action, the business community needs to know that because we need to secure this economy. And so, you know, again, it's I'd execute on the framework because I believe in it. And I would ensure we had a comprehensive strategic plan, not a block and tackle tactical plan like right. I discussed. Right. So maybe we are going to draft you for governor. No, and let you <laughs> Make you run even if you don't want to. Um, so let's talk a bit now about the legislative environment in New Jersey. And there has been a lot going on. What what do you foresee as the big uh, legislative issues in New Jersey uh, that are likely to impact the business community, uh, you know, in 2021? Yeah. So, you know, obviously how we continue to deal with COVID, that's a given any new, any new mandates, again, requiring balance, you know, but the, the, the next big thing is marijuana. I mean, you know, to have been handed marijuana in the middle of all of this, is just like, oh my gosh, can, can we just give the business community a breather? Just let them catch, let them catch up. So, you know, there's the debate right now about workplace safety rules, which I can't even believe we're stuck in this debate. Um, you know, the, 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 the population in New Jersey spoke, they want marijuana to be legalized. Okay. That's, you know, fine. We amended the constitution. It's going to be legal. You know what? Safety first in the workplace. We have safety sensitive positions. When you talk about chemical plants, nuclear plants, transportation, people driving trucks, manufacturing. Okay. I mean, I could go on and on. There shouldn't even be a hint of someone having the ability to show up with marijuana in their system. And that's the challenge is the drug testing. But I believe you said that uh, the current uh, draft of the legislation would would call for um, drug recognition experts, if I have that term right, uh, who would decide whether or not um, somebody was uh, intoxicated on the job. Guess what? Cha-ching, another cost to New Jersey business because you have to now train, hire, keep on file inside, outside, right? That's money. Okay. That's money. And it gets in the way, again, it delays this uh, and, and really concerns about safety, safety in the workplace. So, and yeah. nobody else in the country does this, Jeff. So yet again, okay, New Jersey, extreme outlier. Let's just throw this new thing in there and make it even more difficult in the workplace. Moving on to another issue that's definitely going to be big uh, 2021 is, uh, the state's budget and, uh, you know, it's obviously a very uh, past year, uh, past fiscal year budget was postponed till September. And there are all these strange things due to uh, 
coronavirus, such as postponing it. Um, but to deal with it, there were, no surprise, uh, very stiff tax hikes. And then there was $4.5 billion in borrowing, which uh, I don't see how they could wind up using all of that by next June. Uh, so where does that leave New Jersey when lawmakers you know, get to work on putting together uh, the fiscal year 2022 budget? Let's remind ourselves that 2021 is an election year. And the entirety of our legislature and the governor are all on the ballot. Okay, so the last thing they want is a budget that will be controversial uh, for people when they're going to the ballot box. Uh, that's why we believe uh, this fiscal year budget got so padded. All right, um, because that makes sense because they can walk they can walk into next year and say, look, we, we we didn't raise taxes for the first time in how many years, and look, we have this extra money for spending, okay? Because they clearly padded this year's budget, so we don't want to lose sight of that. And we were we were very vocal and, and and transparent in our belief about that when you looked when you looked at the the heart of the numbers, um, that four point five billion, you know, the whole idea of borrowing money in order to create a rainy day fund. We're in a monsoon right now, okay? Use the rainy day fund we have, that's why it's there. You know, surplus, use the surplus that we have. Um, if we have the need for it in the future, Supreme Court gave them the opportunity to go out and bond in the future. You didn't have to bond for yeah. it now, okay? Yeah. You know, and then the whole idea of that bonding, um, we wound up going out, you know, with, with market rate and they said that they were gonna try to expedite, you know, repayment. I think we have two, two years of interest only payment, which means it's gonna be back ended. So even the whole bonding process wound up becoming, you know, probably more expensive to the next generation than it should be. Yeah, and I, isn't there a promise of checks that are gonna come out in the summer? And I can't even recall what they're for, for people learning what was it? Uh, under one hundred and fifty thousand. Um, you know, just middle class. Yes. Middle class tax relief checks. And it's amazing, you know, the timing of those. So we're in a pandemic now. Everyone's suffering now, but we're going to send those checks out. Guess what? Right. As election season starts. What a surprise. Incredible. <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Do you think that either next year or the following year, uh, we'll see, uh, you know, proposals for even more tax hikes, uh, perhaps a tax on professional services or they'll, or, or they'll bring back this um, micro tax. Uh, are, are we in for, for more of what we've been spending the last four years uh, going through as far as tax hikes are concerned? So let's look at the fact that New Jersey increases taxes when the economy is at its strongest and we increase taxes when the economy is at its weakest, okay? We are subject to concern for taxation every single year. In New Jersey, Jeff, if it can walk and it can talk, it is subject to being taxed, unfortunately. Can you tell us a little bit more about the need for coronavirus related liability protection you know, what, what we have advocated for tirelessly at this point is, you know, any business, um, and not just business, this is educational institutions as well, right. right? Yeah. So if you check all the safety boxes, you know, all the safeguards, all the mandates that say from, you know, WHO, the World Health Organization, or OSHA, or, or the CDC that says this is how you keep people safe, in turn, you should be given protection against liability. Um, and that balance is so significantly important because of the investment being made in these safeguards as well. And in our business outlook survey, we asked questions about this, in fact, and our businesses are significantly concerned. I mean, 70% are concerned about increased cost um, for defending frivolous litigation, because all you need is an employee to wave a flag and you go right into having to defend litigation. And we can't seem to get our legislature to understand that we are not asking for blanket immunity. We are saying that, you know, those that are following the rules need to be protected. That's the balance that is required for the business community, right? It's a non-starter to them. And they don't even see that there's an issue. What do you mean, Michelle? There's not going to be litigation. 
Yeah. We're a litigation I'm, happy state. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, if I was a business owner, I would be petrified by that issue because who knows what could be coming, uh, you know, down the pike for a business. I, I do believe that I think it's it, it's going to hold people who are hanging on to their very last dime. They're going to really consider, do I make that investment to put that plexiglass up? Because I know it'll safeguard people, but you know what, if I'm going to get sued anyway, then why, why bother doing it? Like why bother opening? Like, I think, I think it took yeah. businesses out of the game who could have stayed in the game because when they did the cost benefit analysis of the investment versus the threat of litigation, even if I do this and the minimum revenue I'm going to get in a restricted capacity environment, I think it took a lot of businesses out of the game. Uh, let's take a look now at the, the national level. Uh, and so obviously we have a new administration coming in. Joe Biden was elected president. So let's take a look at, at a few of the issues that, uh, you know, they'll be dealing with. So let's start with uh, federal stimulus money for states. Do you think we'll see another aid package? So I do believe there's a better chance of seeing it with the Biden administration, um, just because of the balance of power and the discussion. Uh, however, I think the jury is out on um, and that we should not rely upon and sit back and do nothing waiting for that right. federal package. So do you think we're going to see higher taxes under the Biden presidency? Given the agenda, there's going to be national policy that is going to drive up taxes. Because we're such a high tax state already, the reality may be that it will cost other states more than it might cost us. Um, we may see salt relief, though, on the other side in New Jersey. So there's some pros and cons. And I also think that maybe our status as an extreme outlier uh, will come down a bit because other states will be forced because of national policy to have increased taxes. So we talked uh, earlier about the need for coronavirus related liability protection. Uh, and we both know that that's extremely difficult to achieve uh, at a state level here in New Jersey. What do you think uh, about that happening at the federal level? Yeah, we think that's the place for it. We think that we need a pandemic relief fund at the federal level that would be um, consistent with like the 9-11 theme that we, that we saw before. So, and that's actually what we've advocated from the business coalition. As we said, we need something like a 9-11 relief fund in right. order to provide from the federal level relief for um, pandemic related losses. Well, let's hope we get that since the state is, uh, is, is I'd be shocked if the state ever passed, some, our state ever, or ever passed something like that. Um, and uh, I assume things look uh, much better for gateway funding uh, under the incoming administration. Would you uh, agree with that? Yeah, indications are that um, we have a much better chance at getting the funding we need to get Gateway going, for sure. Yeah, and I, I think we deserve it. Um, so let's let's just close out uh, by by looking forward, uh, see what you think is going to happen there, and, and maybe there will be some good news on, on these uh, two issues I want to ask you about. So... Um, Obviously, businesses have made a tremendous number of changes to adapt to the pandemic. I mean, uh, more than anything I've ever seen in my life. So, for example, there's been a massive shift to remote working and virtual meetings. And I never thought I'd be spending half of my day looking at the computer and talking to people. But do you think that any of these changes, uh, these types of changes are going to carry over? to the post-pandemic business world? Yeah, I absolutely do. Uh, the reason why I do is because this uh, flexible work environment um, was something that the next generation worker has been and is looking for. Right. And there was a lot of hesitancy on behalf of the more traditional boss, if you will, to go there. Uh, lack of lack of trust, thinking it wouldn't work, you know, et cetera. Now that we've been forced into it, um, people are seeing, hey, we can really make this work. Now, when I say really make it work, I certainly don't think it's ideal. I don't think anybody would. We can all say that we're more productive, but there is a challenge and a downside to this. Number one is, you know, culture, you know, corporate culture is, I know for me personally, I'm the type of leader who walks the building. Okay. 
I, I can't walk the building on Zoom. Um, can I schedule one-on-ones with everybody? Sure, I can, but it's just not the same. You know, two-dimensional and three-dimensional are very, very different. Yep. You know, walk past somebody at the water cooler and have a casual conversation, right? So the ability for teaming um, in real time with whiteboards, not you know, computer screens, and you're you're clicking up. You know, those those types of opportunities, I do think, are the negative the negative aspect of this, as well as burnout. People, the, the lines are so blurred between um, work life and home life. And while in some regards, that's good for people who have to tend to personal and family issues, uh, but the burnout rate that I'm seeing um, in people is extraordinary. And it, it really worries me for the mental health of our workforce. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm, I'm beginning to worry about, about my mental health uh, in that regard. Um, I really uh, Hey, don't. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> uh, so sometimes good things can come out of painful experiences, uh, you know, just in life in general. Uh, so are there any positives that you think may come out of the enormous struggle that businesses and workers have faced during the pandemic? I do. Uh, I live under the mantra of make lemonade out of lemons and the glass is half full. Um, and from challenge comes opportunity. I think for New Jersey businesses, uh, given the role of disruption over the last many years, that this has forced businesses to quickly rethink their business model in a new and innovative way. Uh, and so it forced them to go to places they may not go to uh, otherwise more quickly. And the spirit of entrepreneurism has been stronger than ever. And I think we're gonna to continue to see that into the future. So those are positives that I think are very good for New Jersey and our economy. Yeah, well, this certainly has forced uh, even conservative business owners to uh, really try things I don't think they ever would have tried uh, before. So, uh, Michelle, that about wraps it up. And I really want to thank you for joining us today. Jeff, thank you so much. And I just want to make sure we finish on a positive. New Jersey is a great place to live, work, and raise a family. Let's not lose sight of it. You know, we're still here for a reason. And we'll continue to advocate for all the things that will ensure that we continue to be a great state for the future. Thanks again to Michelle Sakurka for sharing her insights with us. To see the full results of NJBIA's Business Outlook Survey, and to learn more about the New Jersey Business Coalition, visit njbia.org.